Extreme weather is getting more frequent and more intense. And it's obviously and painfully clear that human-induced climate change is to blame. We gotta go that way. There's a massive current though. Here. It's nasty. You're listening to footage from an historic storm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, back in July 2010. We got upwards of nine inches of rain. That's Paige Peters. I'm the founder of Rapid Radicals Technology. I'm Colleen DeBase, and we'll get back to that incredible storm in a second. I'm Sue Williams, and Paige is one of the recipients of the Story Exchange's first ever Women in Science Incentive Prize, where we supply small grants to women in science fighting climate change. I did a lot of high-fiving around it. (laughs) Our most recent prize went specifically to women working in water, and we'll hear from some in this podcast. And the idea is that, with the world getting hotter by the day, we need innovative solutions to help prevent catastrophic destruction. And women, who are disproportionately impacted by climate change, and who are often dismissed or discriminated against in the scientific community, may in fact be the ones to get us out of this mess that the human population has created. We've already moved by four or five cars out. So back to Milwaukee. And it's over our shoulders. The storm of July 2010 was a historic storm event. We haven't had one of quite that magnitude since then. We will absolutely have it again. I'm not swimming this. Paige, who was just finishing her environmental engineering degree at Marquette University, was interning that fateful summer at the... The Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, about a mile from where we're sitting right now. Here's WISN 12 News. A lot of this rain has just been what we call training. It's moving over the same locations over and over and over. Sheets of rain across southern Wisconsin. This is a flash flooding situation that needs to be... I actually have this very distinct memory of sitting on my couch, looking out my window, watching the rainfall. And you can feel it when, when a city is experiencing something. There is water coming out of the sewers like geysers. There is a waterfall coming down from the office building. I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, indeed. All that water has to go somewhere. It finds its way into our sewers that are connected to an aging infrastructure and are the the basis of our aging infrastructure. There's too much pressure on a system that was built over 100 years ago. The assessment of damage after the storm was part of Paige's job. And there was... A lot of it. The most interesting part for me on that day afterwards was driving around in a district vehicle in neighborhoods that had basements flooded. Could you just talk about the public health aspects of sewers overflowing and seeping up through people's basements? When we have these large storm events, we worry about two infrastructure failures, one of them being This sewage that's mixed with rainwater discharges into lakes and rivers. The second one being when those systems become backed up, they're all connected to our homes. When those basement backups occur, it's raw sewage that goes into people's basements. Oh, yeah. Oh, disgusting. Sewage is full of pathogens that can cause gastrointestinal illnesses with individuals, especially, especially children, especially the elderly. As she drove around after the storm, You could feel this frustration, this need to talk to the district and figure out what are my resources for dealing with this basement backup, my basement flooded with sewage. How do I deal with it? It probably didn't seem fortuitous at the time, but Paige's advisor at Marquette, Dan Zinnemer, was asking those very same questions himself. I live about a mile away and my basement flooded. And that led me to think, we need to have a technology that can handle a lot of water very quickly and treat it very rapidly. He started musing on this idea. There has got to be some technology that is capable of treating water in less than 30 minutes compared to the 8 to 14 hours it typically takes. It was something of a revelation. Dan invited Paige to help develop this rapid technology as part of her master's work at Marquette. It took us about a year and a half to hit that proof of concept. Well, let's hope it happens. Let's keep working on it. It was truly capable of effecting the change that we wanted to see for this industry, for infrastructure, for wet weather treatment. (laughs) 
When they presented their idea to Milwaukee's sewerage district, we hung up on that phone call, and I will never forget this moment. Dan turned to her and says, you should start a company. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means. Paige had zero background in business and didn't want to derail her academic career. But she also thought, maybe I can do this. So I founded Rapid Radicals, which was developed to commercialize this core technology. If you're wondering why it's called Rapid Radicals, we asked. It has something to do with oxidation. The hydroxyl radical is the strongest oxidant known to science. The more you produce, the faster you produce them, the better your treatment, the faster your treatment. So we rapidly produce radicals. And here's a detail I love. And when I was thinking about the name, my first thought was radical waters, but the feedback I got was that it sounded like a water park. So no one would take me seriously. We visited Paige in Milwaukee to check out how she's building rapid radicals. This is it in all her glory. She gave us a tour of a 40-foot shipping container right next to Lake Michigan, where the technology is being tested at pilot scale. So now we're going to watch. We've got raw sewage coming in, pulling right from the clarifiers outside. It's been raining here, so you can tell that it's Paige is wearing cool. a hard hat, and there's another engineer there. Sure thing. There's rough plywood lining the walls, pipes of all kinds, and three big interconnected vats with water of various colors inside. The first tube takes in the untreated water. Usually this is pretty dark, but this is our poop water that um, we mix with clean water, so it kind of gives us that combined sewer water simulated flow. Okay. Second pipe has clean water going through yeah. it? And by the time we get to our third contactor, because of all the oxidant that's been consumed, the water's pretty clean. So by here, we've made sure that we've hit permit limits for E. coli, and we're able to attack those harmful bacteria and viruses. Imagine if this rapid technology were in place the next time a major storm comes through. You could clean the water as the storm is going, meeting the flow of that storm event. Nice. Oh, 7.9 right on be. the dot. That's where we want to be. That's good. That's good for... Paige California. hopes her system will someday be used by utilities across the U.S., although she's initially focusing on the Great Lakes. She's raised about $1.4 million in funding, thanks in large part to the National Science Foundation's Small Business Innovation Research Program. Rapid Radicals now has four full-time employees, one intern, and a student research team at Marquette. And what Paige is doing could not be more timely. We're seeing places like Jackson, Mississippi, completely without drinkable water because of flooding that is overwhelming the aging infrastructure. A news reporter in Jackson recently posted a video of the dark brown water coming out of her faucet. And it's just really stomach-churning and just disgusting to watch. Ugh. Yeah, and especially when you think of everything these days that might be in our water. We designed these sewer systems in the 1920s. What's in our wastewater now is completely different than what was in our wastewater in the 1920s. Now we're worried about antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, we're worried about personal care products, microplastics. We continue living in a society that is all about convenience and flushing whatever annoys us or inconveniences us down the toilet. That goes somewhere. We'll be back after a brief break. Stick around. The Story Exchange is an award winning nonprofit media platform that elevates women's voices and achievements. Our $25,000 Women in Science Incentive Prize supports female scientists addressing climate change. Find out more at thestoryexchange.org. We're back, and we're talking to innovative women in science working in the field of water. Their work's becoming more urgent as we see more floods and also more droughts. Right down the way from where Paige Peters is testing out her new technology is the hometown of Brittany Kendrick. I'm from the south side of Chicago, born and raised. Brittany's another one of our Women in Science Incentive Prize winners. I am the co-founder and CEO of Hydronomy Inc. And it's a water technology sustainability company. Hydronomy will literally suck moisture from the air using solar power. 
and convert it into clean drinking water, which can be used for bathing, cleaning, and drinking. Growing up along the shores of Lake Michigan, Brittany was always aware of water. My very first introduction around water insecurity or water scarcity was a Chicago Tribune article that came out about, you know, water quality in Chicago pipes. I remember my parents stating like, hey, we're not drinking this water anymore. We're gonna start drinking distilled water. Brittany also has family in New Orleans, and the flooding caused by Hurricane Katrina in 2005 made a huge impact on her. We lost my grandparents' home, which is located in the Lower Ninth Ward. It was a place that had been really special to Brittany. So the house I spent all my summers in New Orleans where my grandfather kept his boat, his shrimp boat, everything. Um, that was the home that was lost in the storm. Brittany went on to become a civil engineer specializing in water and headed to New York University for her master's in urban infrastructure systems. She studied at NYU while working full time for the Army Corps of Engineers. I primarily design blueprints or plan sheets of large water-related infrastructure, such as levees or flood walls. She got the idea for hydronomy while helping a group of public policy students on a class project. I was asked on a fluke where they were like, hey, we're looking for an engineer consultant to help test a proof of concept um, related to water. She helped the students design an atmospheric water generator. That's a device that extracts water from the air. That device that I concocted was powered by electricity, but then also was powered by solar energy. And as a real test of its merits, the students placed it high up in Brooklyn. We have to be concerned about what other pollutants are we pulling, considering it's coming from the air, right? And so I selected that let's test this proof of concept device on the rooftops of Bushwick, New York, where it's known to have the worst air quality possible. And when Brittany read the results, let's just say she was pleasantly surprised. Wow, this is doable. It's got like one or two like pollutants in it, but you can filter this out with a simple sand media. And I was like, this can be such a cheaper alternative to our existing water sourcing and tap water. I'm gonna do jog. And that's exactly what Brittany's working on today. We visited her recently at New Lab. And we should explain what New Lab is. Well, it's a massive structure in the Brooklyn Navy Yard that dates back to 1902. It's where workers built battleships and aircraft carriers during World Wars I and II. Today, it functions more as an R&D lab, a place where startups and makers and even artists can go to use the metal shops or the woodworking studios or 3D printers. And it's where Brittany and her two co-founders, Xavier Henderson and Corey Salter, it's where they are turning that class project into a business. I inherited all of this equipment from those public policy students who were like, thanks, you wrote our thesis out, bye. Um, and so I remember, you know, tinkering around with the equipment. And she thought, there's a business opportunity here. Brittany and her partners are now courting investors, completing data, setting up manufacturing. Um, you guys got safety glasses on? Okay, good. I can talk now. Yeah, you could just be over there and just tell us what you're doing in, uh, okay. a little bit. So for the hydronomies um, device that we've created that is patent pending, and we're doing like sample testing on what the exterior shell will look like, what type of material is best, what is the uh, artistic or aesthetic features that we want to apply. The units so right that now, Brittany and her team are designing will one day, they hope, be used by single-family households. So it allows families to generate and source their water on-site at their homes with an off-grid um, technology device. And are you making enough water, well, for uh, a family of four to take showers? For the device that we're building here in New Labs is expected to service a family of four at its current water demand, which is about 300 gallons a day. What? I know. <laughs> it's enough moisture in the air. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's incredible. It really is. And 
Even better, the goal for this technology is to be more affordable than what you might pay through your local utility. COVID-19 taught us a lot about how people are not able to even afford their water bills because of, you know, being out of work and whatnot. And it also aims to solve problems of water quality and environmental justice. Within five years, I hope that hydronomy is deployed in several different U.S. markets that are addressed or challenged and stricken with the water crises, so such as Jackson, Mississippi, Newark, uh, New Jersey, Flint, Michigan, et cetera, et cetera, where the large population of black and brown people. As Brittany knows only too well from her family's experience in New Orleans, communities of color tend to be most impacted by catastrophic storms or aging pipes that leach lead and other contaminants into the water. I mean, this country was founded in racism, so nevertheless, I don't allow that to stifle me, but it is certainly something that I am sensitive towards. Brittany's felt it herself, even as a highly educated engineer. Being a woman, and not just a woman, but a Black woman that is working in STEM, it is incredibly difficult because, one, I'm prejudged about, do I know what I'm talking about? Do I have the competency level? Do I have even the access to the networks that I need to support me? You good on the Z? No center Z or center on everything? Okay. I try not to hold on to it, but there are very vivid moments in my career that I was like, there's no other reason why this is happening. It's because I'm a black woman. I don't fold to it you should value me and my perspective because it, it adds to the texture of how we consider water, how I've lived through water, and how my community lives through water. As we close out this episode, we want to mention a few other winners of our Women in Science and Center Prize who are just as impressive as Paige and Brittany. There's Pratiksha Dongri at Rice University. She's developed a system that removes salt and other minerals from brackish water using solar energy and nanophotonics. Well, there's also Cindy Hu of Harvard University, who has created a website, whatisinmywater.org, that offers people an intimate view of the contaminants in their water supply. And then there's Zhu Ying Li of Dartmouth College, who creates modeling techniques to predict how water volume may change over time in hundreds of U.S. watersheds. If you want to be truly inspired, you can read more about all these amazing ladies on our site at thestoryexchange.org. And stay tuned. We'll soon be announcing the winners of this year's competition, where we're looking at women trying to improve air quality. We thank Paige Peters and Brittany Kendrick for sharing their stories and for doing this important work. And we thank you for listening. This has been The Story Exchange. Join us next time to hear more stories about innovative and inspirational women doing the things you'd never dream of. Or maybe you would. If you like this podcast, please share on social media or post a review wherever you listen. It helps other people find the show and visit our website at thestoryexchange.org where you'll find news, videos, and tips for entrepreneurial women. And we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line at info at thestoryexchange.org or find us on Facebook. I'm Colleen DeBase, sound editing provided by Nusha Balian. Interviews recorded by Sam Shin. Production coordinator is Noelle Flago with additional help from Kate Brennan. Our mixer is Pat Donahue from String and Can. Executive producers are Sue Williams and Victoria Wong, recorded at Cutting Room Studios in New York City. 